Dear Esther, the morning after I was washed ashore, salt in my ears, sand in my mouth, and the waves always at my ankles, I felt as though everything had conspired to this one last shipwreck. I remembered nothing but water, stones in my belly and my shoes, threatening to drag me under to where only the most listless of creatures swim. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. I found myself to be as featureless as this ocean, as shallow and unoccupied as this bay, a listless wreck without identification. My rocks are these bones and a careful fence to keep the precipice at bay. Shot through me caves, my forehead a mount. This aerial will transmit into me so. All overexposed, the nervous system, where Donnelly's boots and yours and mine still trample. I will carry a torch for you. I will leave it at the foot of my headstone. You will need it for the tunnels that carry me under.
Donnelly reported the legend of the hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. A wonderful sight, the moon cresting the junction between the cliff path and the stone circle. It cast a shadow of the ridge across the beach, all the world as if you had signed your name in untidy handwriting. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and notice and aid, or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. We are not like Lot's wife, you and I. We feel no particular need to turn back. There's nothing to be seen if we did. No tired old man parting the cliffs with his arms. No gifts or Bibles laid out on the sand for the taking. No tides turning or the shrieking gulls overhead. The bones of the hermit are no longer laid out for the taking. I have stolen them away to the guts of this island, where the passages all run to black, and where we can light each other's faces by their strange luminescence.
Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. This hermit, this seer, this distant historian of bones and old bread, where did he vanish to? Why, asked the farmers, why, asked Jacobson, why bother with your visions at all if you're just to throw your arms up at the cliff and let it close in behind you and seal you into the belly of the island, a museum shut to all but the most devoted? He still maintains he wasn't drunk, but tired. I can't make the judgment or the distinction anymore. I was drunk when I landed here, and tired too. I walked up the cliff path in near darkness and camped in the bay where the trawler lies beached. It was only at dawn that I saw the bothy and decided to make my temporary lodgings there. I was expecting just the aerial and a transmitter stashed in a weatherproof box somewhere on the mount. It had an air of uneasy permanence to it. Like all the other buildings here, erosion seems to have evaded it completely. Mm -hmm. 